Well, I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews this morning. We come to what is really a pivotal point in the book of Hebrews, where he's going to kind of turn a corner of uh, talking about what, from talking about what we believe now to sort of how we behave and kind of encourage us in our walk. So Hebrews chapter 10 is where we are today, and we come to the last half of this chapter, uh, verses 19 through uh, 39. In a few moments, we will read the text as we go through it. By the way, as you're locating the text there and making notes of things to pray for, we've mentioned the national need, but a, a more church-specific need. As some of you know, a member of our church, Michael Fry, he plays the guitar occasionally here. He's a seminary student in our church. Uh, he was heading down to Southeastern Friday. He was in a car accident uh, going to seminary, uh, totaled his car, broke his collarbone and a few other bones, and uh, he's home this weekend with families from North Carolina being taken care of there. So um, put Michael down on your prayer list. Pray for him and his recovery, and uh, I'm sure uh, he would appreciate the encouragement. If you know him, call him, text him, send him a note. I know he would uh, greatly appreciate that. So let's be mindful of him uh, as well. Well, Hebrews chapter 10 is where we are, and again, in a moment, we'll begin reading in verse 19. If you have found that, I'll ask that you join with me as we briefly pray, and then we'll begin our study together. Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we ask for the Word of God to be clear and effective in our hearts. We know that it will not return void, but it will accomplish everything that you intend. And so, Father, we pray that it will accomplish its purpose in our midst, that it might reprove us, rebuke us, instruct us, and train us in righteousness. For the sake of your glory, and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. The great pharmacist Mary Poppins... <clears throat> taught us that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. She said that because in, in many medications, the raw active ingredients, as you probably know, can be very bitter and unpleasant tasting. And so for decades now, chemists have actually added flavoring and coloring and even coatings to our pills to make them easier to swallow. In fact, I fact-checked this with one of our church members who's a pharmacist, and he told me it is true that most medicines you take today have more inactive ingredients in them than active ingredients. That's how they're manufactured. And generally speaking, these inactive ingredients that give it its shape, its size, its color, they're not usually a problem today. But they were a problem Back in 1937, that year, pharmacists discovered a new sort of wonder drug that was very effective at killing an, a certain kind of bacteria. But this particular medication, in its raw form, could not be digested. So it had to be dissolved. So there was a, a chemist by the name of Henry Watkins who was given the task of figuring out how to dissolve this and make it fit for human consumption. And Watkins discovered that the easiest and cheapest way to dissolve it was to combine it with something called diethylene glycol. Now, if you don't speak chemistry, diethylene glycol is what we popularly call antifreeze. 633 batches of this new drug were prepared, shipped, and sold in the U.S. And in that year, 1937, 107 people died because that inactive ingredient was basically poison. And by the way, that incident was what gave rise to the creation of the Food and Drug Administration. Now, when we take medications, we expect the active ingredients to help us. We don't expect the inactive ingredients to hurt us. And in a similar sense, what was true of that inactive ingredient is also true 
of inactive faith. Just as that inactive ingredient was harmful, so too inactive faith is harmful. Not not only is faith without works dead, but I would argue that faith without works is also deadly. Because inactive faith is ineffective faith. And ineffective faith saves no one. As Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. But only those who do the will of my Father. In other words, possessing a Christian vocabulary is not the same thing as possessing Christian faith. Knowing the right words, repeating the right phrases, having some mental awareness is not the same thing as truly following Christ. And in our passage today, the pastor author who's been writing the book of Hebrews, he does not want anyone in his church to have a false faith. He doesn't want anyone in his church to have an empty faith. He doesn't want anyone to have an inactive faith, which he's going to show them is actually a toxic and deadly faith. And so he's going to urge them in this passage, not just to have faith, but to have active faith. To have a living faith. A breathing, moving, functioning faith. The kind of faith that doesn't just show up in our words, but shows up in our deeds. The kind of faith that not only leads us to be church attenders on Sunday, but it leads us to be evangelists on Monday. The kind of faith that governs what we post on Facebook. The the kind of faith that, that motivates us to visit the sick in our Sunday school class. The kind of faith that drives us to, to invite church members over for dinner and to fellowship around the table with one another. The kind of faith that would move us to take our vacation time and to go on disaster relief. The kind of faith that would compel us not just to be around the body of Christ, but to actually enhance the body of Christ. In other words, our passage reminds us that workless faith is worthless faith. And so the question this morning is, what kind of faith do you have? Is it an inactive poison in your soul? Or is it an active anchor for your soul? Another way that I could maybe ask this question is, given everything that we have learned up to this point, from Hebrews 1 all the way now to the middle of chapter 10, given everything we've learned about our Savior, given who He is and what He's done, given the fact that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, who through the incarnation took on human flesh, He was made lower than the angels and better than Moses and better than Joshua and better than Aaron, that through all of this He endured suffering on our behalf, that in His body He became the sacrifice for our sins, that He died on the cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God, is now our confidence, is now our priest, is now the one who is sanctifying and making us perfect in the eyes of God and the one who will come again and receive us unto himself. Given who he is, what kind of faith does he deserve? That's the question of this passage. Does he deserve a one hour on Sunday faith? Does he deserve a minimalist faith? Or does he deserve a bold, robust faith, the kind that changes your calendar and your to-do list and your priorities and your checkbook? So the author is going to urge us and compel us and push us to have an active faith. And I invite you to examine your faith to see of what kind and what quality it is. The passage before us gives to us four priorities, four priorities of an active faith. 
And I want to summarize these as we go through each little section here and encourage you to look at yourself, to look at your own life and see if this is true of you. The first priority we see in verse, comes in verses 19 through 25. This is the first section here. And here he simply tells us that we must actively live out the faith. That we must actively live out the faith. Now, this is a very general summary of some very specific instructions. And in many ways, this first section here, think of it, it's like the fountainhead of the rest of the passage. He's kind of getting to the main point, and then he's going to kind of, it's going to trickle down to, to everything else. But his point in this first section here is this. He's going to show us that real faith shows up in real life. And if it doesn't show up in your real life, it's not real faith. Look what he says, verse 19. Therefore, brethren. Now, that little word, therefore, is massive. Okay, We have ten and a half chapters behind the therefore. I can't repeat it all to you. You can go back and listen to all the sermons. But it's, it's based on everything that we've seen about Jesus. Therefore, brethren. By the way, to be clear, he's not just talking about to the male members of the church. It's brethren and sister, if you will. This is... All the people, the men and the women, are involved. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, verse 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, if you don't have time to memorize the entire book of Hebrews, and I doubt you do, I would recommend you start with these four verses. He's just summarized ten and a half chapters of the book. This is the pivot point of the book where he says, now based on everything that we have seen about Jesus, he's, gonna, he's focused on how, what we believe. Now he's going to focus on how we behave. He says, therefore, since the, the, the old Mosaic covenant is the old dead way of approaching God, and since the Jesus covenant is the new and living way of approaching God, and since we have a living covenant, and since we have a living Savior, that means we need to have a living faith. Since all of this is true that we have seen, he says, let us, verse 22, draw near with a sincere heart. Draw near to who? Draw near to God. So if we're going to have an active faith, what does it look like? Well, the first part is, he says, we draw near to God. If we're going to live it out, what do we do? We draw near to God. He say, what does that mean? I, I explained it in the first service so that my six-year-old could understand. It means if you have an active faith, you will spend time with Jesus. You will draw. It's not that you just can draw near to God. It's that you will draw near to God. An active faith shows up in that way. Does spending time with Jesus have a place in your daily to-do list? I'm not asking you if you think prayer is important. I'm asking you, do you actually pray? Are there moments that drive you to your knees in total and utter dependence upon God that you draw near to Him because in some ways you have nowhere else to turn? Draw near, he says, with full assurance. And by the way, the assurance, the reason we have full assurance is not because of us and what we've done. Our assurance is based upon Christ and what He's done. That's these ten chapters. Based on all of that, we can draw near and come to God. So if you have an active faith, you will spend time with Jesus. If you're not spending time with Jesus, you have a reason to be concerned. Now he's not done. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Hold fast the confession of our hope. It means to to grip tightly, to possess hope now in this life. The, The picture that came to mind when he says this, hold fast the confession of our hope, it reminds me of what um oftentimes big companies will do with a law firm. They don't just hire a lawyer for this case in this case what do they do they typically have a lawyer on what do we call it retainer you know what it means to be on retainer 
It means at any moment, you can give them a call. At any moment, they're there to help you. He says here, your hope in Christ, you need to have it on retainer. So that at any moment that you need it, you can turn to it and draw strength from it and get the help that you need. And he says here, if your faith is active, then you're going to draw hope day by day. So that when you turn on the nightly news and you see hurricanes and earthquakes and violence and corruption, rather than wringing your hands in despair, you will go to bed with peace in your heart and a smile on your face because you know that Jesus is king. Let us draw Hope and hold fast our confession. And how can, why can we do that? For, look at verse 23, he who promised is faithful. Listen, if you don't, you, you don't strengthen your faith by looking at yourself, you strengthen your faith by looking at Jesus. If you're saying, man, I don't obey like I should, then don't keep looking at yourself, look to him who did obey like he should. So, If our faith is active, we're going to spend time with Jesus, draw near to him. If our faith is active, we're going to have hope on retainer and use it in our day-to-day life. But also, verse 24, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. By the way, did you notice that little phrase there? And let us, at the risk of sounding cheesy, some call this the lettuce patch of the New Testament. He says, therefore, brethren, let us, let us, let us, let us. So this is, we're all in this together. This is not just something you do as an individual in your own sort of cloistered Christian life. No, no, no. This is a call to the church as a community, as a body. We're all in this together. And specifically here, he says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So if you have an active faith, you're going to spend time with Jesus, you're going to have hope on retainer, and you're going to proactively help your fellow church members. That's what he's saying. You're proactively looking out for those around you to stimulate them, to hold them accountable, to help them in their love and good deeds. I like how Mark Dever says it. He says, church members must scheme and plot for good in one another's lives. When's the last time you sat around and sort of said, now who can I bless today? Who can I love on today in my church? That's what he's saying there. Let us consider, think about how we, the King James has goad each other to kind of provoke each other, to encourage each other towards greater love and good deeds. By the way, I think that verse shows us that in any church, and even in our church, that no church is, is, has ever arrived. There's more love to be shown. There's more good deeds to be done. And sometimes we need to nudge each other and figure out what that is in our lives. We must help each other towards that end. I'll give you a real life example. A couple weeks ago, I spoke to two visitors who had been to our church. uh, And uh, one of them, I I spoke to her on a Wednesday. She told me, uh, one one in person, the other one by email. The first person, when I saw her, she said, I have to tell you, she said, this church is the friendliest church I've ever been to. And the other lady by email said, this is the most unfriendly church I've ever been to. (laughs) They came the same Sunday to the same service. Now, what does that mean? I think it means we're doing verse 24, but we can do it better. There's some more love to be shown. There's more good deeds to engage in, more hands to shake, more hugs to give, more prayers to be said. We've never arrived as a church. We have to keep pushing each other in that direction. And by the way, if you've been visiting for us for a while and you say, well, I'm thinking about maybe joining the church or I'm kind of looking around. Listen, please don't think, oh, I've got to find the perfect church. There is no perfect church. In fact, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. <laughs> this says, find an imperfect church and improve it. Find an imperfect church and make it better. Find an imperfect church and do your part to help them grow in the likeness of Christ. And how do we do that? Verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So he says, if we're going to have an active faith, our active faith, number one, we will spend time with Jesus. This is how we live it out. 
We spend time with Jesus. We have hope on a retainer. We encourage uh, other Christians and help them. And finally, we prioritize going to church. We prioritize the gathering of Christians. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, the gathering of the people. That is a necessary discipline if you're going to have an active faith. I just told a person the other day, we were talking, a gentleman who's been coming to our church, I, he was asking about this, and we were talking about church, and I reminded him, and I will remind you, the local church is God's plan A, and there's no plan B. He didn't start a parachurch ministry when he ascended. He didn't start a university, as great as those are. Jesus established the local church. And the local church is the way in which we are to gather and assemble and be known. John Wesley used to say the Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. He's right. We are to be an organic body by which we help one another and encourage one another. By the way, if you want a really easy diagnostic tool for verses 24 and 25 about helping each other in the church and how you think about church, I'll give you a really quick diagnostic tool. This is how you know if these verses are making sense to you. Is when you talk about your home church, whatever that is, if it's Forest or somewhere else, when you talk about your home church, do you speak of it in the first person or the third person? Do you talk about we and us or them and they? That'll show you a difference. How do you think about the assembly? How do you think about those around you? Is it I've taken ownership because I'm in this together or am I just a spectator who's going to criticize from a distance? No, no, no. He says if you have an act of faith, you're going to live it out with those around you and together you're going, it's going to be visible and seen and obvious to the world. D.L. Moody was once criticized by a lady for his confrontational evangelistic methods. And Moody said, well, I'm sorry to hear that you don't like how I do that. He says, well, tell me, how do you share the gospel? And the woman sort of fumbled her words, and it quickly became evident that she didn't that often. To which Moody responded, well, I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. Listen, faith is not just thinking the right things. It involves doing the right things. Faith involves action. We are to think and speak and love and help and serve and to seek out for one another's good. Again, his point here is not do this so that you can be justified. No, no, no. He's already said that through Christ you've been cleansed and washed. Justification has already been accomplished. Now we pursue sanctification is what he's saying. And you live out that faith. My friends, we cannot live the totality of our Christian life through our phones. We have to be in each other's lives. And more than just th this hour. If we're going to do this and take this seriously, it has to make its way out in many other ways. I heard a quote recently that said, everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to help mom do the dishes. That's basically what he's saying here. Listen, youth leaders do not grow on trees. Neither do mission trips or nursery workers or disaster relief volunteers or prayer groups. They don't sprout out of the ground. It calls for every one of us to l actually live out the faith. So are you living it out? Is it visible and active in this way? Secondly, he tells us we must actively beware false faith. Not only should we actually live out the faith, but we should secondly beware of false faith. I wanted to use the word ostensible, but I'm not sure I know what the word ostensible means. Notice how he ended verse 25. He ended verse 25, he says what? Help each other all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay, what, what, what does he mean by the day drawing near? Okay, now listen, if you're visiting day and you're not a Christian and maybe you know nothing about the Bible, listen, I, I, this is going to sound confusing. I'm going to explain it, okay? Um, there's, there, when we talk about one thing that we believe as the church New Testament teaches, there is a difference, believe it or not, between the Lord's day and the day of the Lord. I know it sounds grammatically like those should be the same thing, but they're not the same thing. The Lord's day is when Jesus rose from the dead. It's Sunday. That's today. This is the Lord's day. The day of the Lord is the day of judgment. Okay? So when he says, 
assemble together and encourage each other all the more as you see the day. Many people think he means, oh, the Lord's day. As you see Sunday coming, call each other up and invite them. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. The day he's talking about is not the Lord's day, it's the day of the Lord. Because with every passing day, judgment day is getting closer and closer to you and me. And so he says in verse 26, 4, If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but what? A terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Now, this is a very serious warning. We saw something like this earlier in Hebrews chapter 6. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. But he speaks of those who who go on sinning willfully. If you write in your Bible, underline that word willfully or deliberately, depending on your translation. That's the emphasis here. It's not just the person who sins. that they're. In, it's the person who goes on sinning intentionally and unrepentantly. And it's a person who knows the difference. They've received the knowledge of the truth. They know the ABCs, they know the gospel, and they choose to reject it and walk away from it. He says, there is no sacrifice for their sins. They can pile up all the goats that they want. They can do all, say all the Hail Marys they want. They can do whatever penance they want, but they're not going to absolve their sins because there's no other way to be forgiven. He says, so if they know the gospel and they turn from the gospel, then what they're going to receive is judgment. And that's what they can expect. My friends, there's a difference between knowing about Jesus and actually knowing Jesus. And these are people who know about Jesus, but they don't actually know him. And so they have this knowledge, but they turn from the knowledge to go in their own direction. What I find interesting about this is this is a warning. This is not a warning for ignorant people. You know who this is a warning for? Church people. He's talking to church folk. And he says, if you know the message and you go on deliberately, willfully sinning and you turn from those things, the only thing you have to expect on judgment day is not mercy or grace, but it is, in fact, punishment. Notice his argument, verse 28. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So he's going to argue here from the lesser to the greater. So he says... The reason I'm saying this is because in the law of Moses, what happened? In the old covenant, if you heard the law and you said, I don't care, I want to live my own way, I want to do what I want to do, and you turned your back on the law of God, he said all it took was two or three people pointing it out and they would stone you. If under that inferior covenant, such a punishment was dealt out, verse 29 How much more severe punishment do you think he will deserve who's trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? Remember, his question here is, how much more will such a person be punished? This is a person who goes to Sunday school, a person who got the stickers and attendance and as, as a child. They bring their Bible, they know the hymns, they know the language, maybe they've been baptized, they eat the Lord's Supper, they've done all those things, but there comes a point when they turn aside and decide, I'm going to do what I want to do, and they continue in that. And he says, you know what they can expect? Judgment. He says, they've tr- listen to the language, trampled underfoot the Son of God, regarded his blood as unclean and have insulted the spirit of grace. In other words, they have committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, a sin which cannot be forgiven, Jesus said. And so he says in verse 30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. My friends, Jesus not only has scars in his hands, but he also has a gavel in his hands. The early church was right. Jesus ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Now, I know there's many people today that don't want to hear that message, and they would rather skip sections like this, really heavy 
in your face sections like this, but we need to hear it. It's very uncomfortable. I understand that. But can I just say two things to you? First of all, don't trust any preacher who won't tell you about God's judgment. And furthermore, don't trust any preacher who only tells you about God's judgment. But second of all, the reason we need to hear this is because since the Garden of Eden, we've been trying to plug our ears and walk away as if this doesn't count, as if this doesn't exist. In fact, if you go read your Bible carefully, the very first doctrine ever denied in Scripture was the doctrine of judgment. The serpent looked at the woman and said, what? You shall not surely die. God's just bluffing. And God says, try me. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And so for those who would have such an inactive faith, who would know the truth to walk away from it, he says you need to beware in yourself and you need to beware in others because it's a terrifying thing. What should we do instead? Well, the third section, he tells us that we must actively imitate strong faith. We must actively imitate strong faith. That's verses 32 to 35. So the pastor not only wants us to look forward to judgment day, but he also wants them to look backward. Look at 32. But remember. See that? Not just look forward. Remember. Look back. Remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings. Okay? Now, just a little tip to reading your Bible. Anytime you read the word remember in the Bible, it never means just to recall some data. Remember does not mean Google your mental hard drive and pull up some facts. In the Bible, the word remember means remember and do. Remember and do. It doesn't mean know the lesson. It means learn the lesson. Okay, So he says, remember the former days in the past when after being enlightened. So he says, you guys... I want, you to, I want you to keep going in the right direction. He's like, you guys remember when we started out as a church plant here in, in, likely in Rome, when we started as a church plant, man, it was tough. It was hard. There was only a few of us and it was difficult. And he says there, when we, we started out, you endured a great conflict of sufferings. The word gr- conflict there is the Greek word athletes, from which you get the word athletic. The, the idea here is a physical contest, like a wrestling or a boxing match. He says here, you, you, you were in this, this violent competition of sorts, and he says it was a great conflict and you suffered. In fact, many historians point to certain events in history, and there's one specifically in Rome, where a guy named Claudius, he kicked out all the Jews from a certain part of Rome because there was a riot. And in Claudius's writings, he says... A riot took place, before he kicked them out, he says a riot took place because some of the Jews in the synagogues introduced someone named Christus, which is most likely Christ. So some of the Jews came in and said, we have found the Messiah, and the Jews got mad, and there was a whole mob mentality, and the Romans said, I don't want this headache, and they sent all the Jews out. Whether it's that specific event or not, we don't know. But he says here, you endured a great conflict when the church was planted. How did that happen? Look at verse 33. Partly, or on the one hand, by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations. And partly, or on the other hand, by becoming sharers for those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners. So he says, when the church was planted... I want you to remember, he says, the early days of this church plant. And it was tough, but it was, in some ways, it was exciting because we saw our faith making a difference. And our our faith, it was controversial, yes, but we were pressing on. And he says, in the process, some of you were made a public spectacle. The Greek word is actually where we get the English word theater from. You were a laughing stock. You were publicly humiliated. People mocked you and insulted you for your faith. And he says, you guys, you remember that. Not only that, but you were sharers with those who were so treated. In other words, from Sunday to Sunday, a number of the church members wound up in prison. And after the service was over, the church would say, all right, well, let's go visit Bob in prison. 
And they would risk public ridicule to identify with a known prisoner because of his faith in Christ. And so he says, you identified with them and you cared for them. It's what Jesus said, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was in prison and you visited me. And they said, Jesus, when were you in prison? When did any of that happen? And Jesus said, to the extent that you did it to one of these, my brethren, even the least of them, you did it to me. And he says, you joyfully accepted the seizure of your property. Now that might be the most out-of-place adverb in the entire Bible. You joyfully accepted the seizure of your property? I mean, if the U.S. government came in this week and, and condemned and outlawed Christianity, I wonder, and, and confiscated our stuff, I wonder how many of us would still show up next week with smiles on our faces. That's what he says you did. And he says that, <laughs> I've seen it in you. I've, I've seen what you can do in your faith. My friends, these verses here remind us the comfortable church must not forget about the persecuted church. Free believers must not overlook the imprisoned believers. Listen, if you really want to apply this passage, you need to this afternoon go look up Open Doors Ministry or Voice of the Martyrs and find out what's going on in the world. Because while we sit here in freedom, preaching and teaching, there are countless of our brothers and sisters imprisoned and being tortured. According to one statistic I saw this week, by the time you go to bed tonight, in this one 24-hour period, seven churches will be destroyed and 11 Christians will be killed on average. That's the day in 2017. By the way, if you want a great book on the subject, a modern book, The Insanity of God by Nick Ripkin. You need to read it. The Insanity of God by Nick Ripkin. I don't know if it's in that book or somewhere else that I heard him, but Ripkin said once, quote, I have never met a liberal Christian in a country where the church is persecuted. Because persecution separates the wheat from the chaff and the sheep from the goats. I don't want it to happen here in the States, but it might be the best thing for the evangelical church. Because the light shines the brightest against the blackness in the backdrop. So what does he say because of all this? What does he say? Verse 35, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. I, I've seen, he says, the courage that you had back then when we started. Why are you now thinking about leaving it? No, no, no. Go back and remember those days. I've seen you do it once. I see that you can do it again. There's actually one way of reading this text. It's as if he says to them, you guys remember all that persecution stuff? Yeah. Well, guess what? It's happening again. Suck it up. Deal with it. You've already dealt with it. You can deal with it again. Let's be faithful. Let's be committed. Let's be bold and strong in our faith. At the time of Henry VIII, there was a famous English reformer, a preacher named Hugh Latimer. Uh, Henry VIII, by the way, if you don't know, he was a known adulterer and a philanderer. Henry VIII showed up on one Sunday to hear Latimer preach, and I don't know if it was designed or not, but Latimer's message that morning was preaching against sexual sin. And Latimer, in his very typical fashion, was very bold and very direct in the message, and Henry VIII was embarrassed. That week, word was sent back to Latimer, and Henry VIII asked him, well, told him, to apologize the next Sunday. And so Latimer thought about it, Latimer prayed about it, Latimer spent some time with friends and neighbors and his church, and the next Sunday, with Henry VIII in attendance, Latimer stood up, and he started the sermon by asking a question, as if somebody was talking to him. He said, Latimer, dost thou knowest who thou speakest to this day? And he answered, indeed, to God Almighty himself. And instead of apologizing for the message from last Sunday, he proceeded to preach the exact same message <laughs> that Sunday. It's no surprise that eventually Hugh Latimer died as a martyr. My friend, that is strong, courageous faith. That's the kind of faith we need to imitate. That's the kind of faith we need to pursue. My friends, for many of us, the biggest idol that we face is the idol called comfort. We don't want to be uncomfortable. If I talk to that person about the gospel, or if I share the truth with them, it's, it's going to be inconvenient. Them going to hell is going to be much more inconvenient. Inconvenient. 
We need to stand up for Christ and stand up for the gospel. And if it lands us in hot water, it may. In fact, it may land us in the fiery furnace. But guess what? It's better to be in the fiery furnace with Him who is like the Son of God than to be outside the fiery furnace without Him. Maybe God's not calling you to confront the King of England, but maybe He's calling you to stand up for Christ to your co-worker or your family member or a loved one or a neighbor. We need to imitate that kind of strong faith. Finally, we need to actively press on by faith. Press on by faith. Notice where he ends, verse 36. For you have need of endurance. In other words, he says, you guys started well. My concern is that you now end well. Jesus is not just looking for those who start the race. He's looking for those who actually finish the race. And you, he says, as a church, you need to endure. You need to press on. You need to keep going. Let's be honest, many times we come to church, listen, you don't need me to teach you a new lesson, you just need to be reminded to keep doing the old lessons. That's what he's saying here, just press on, just keep doing it. He says there, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. Now, if you've been tracking with Hebrews, you know how significant that statement is. When you have done the will of God, you will receive what was promised. Why is that significant? Because his whole point for 10 chapters has been that Jesus came and did the will of God and he received what was promised. And just as certainly as it happened with our elder brother, just as certainly as it happened with our Lord, so too it will happen for you, those who endure. So verse 37, For yet in a little while he who's coming will come, and he will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. He's quoting from the minor prophet Habakkuk here. And he basically says from Habakkuk, you have two paths you can choose. You can go down the path of faith and continue and press on in the sweat and the toil that it is and be rewarded in the end, or you can start down a path and go down the path of apostasy and in the end you can expect to shrink back and be judged. But we, verse 39, are not of those. He said, I I, I have confidence in you guys. I know my church. I trust in you guys. I believe in you guys. We are not of those who will shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. He says we are called to live by faith. You know what it means to live by faith? To live by faith and to press on in faith means to take God's word and God's promises and rearrange your entire life around those promises to rearrange your priorities and your hours and how you spend your time and your conversations and your words and what movies you watch and everything that you do, he says you you arrange it all around what God says. That is living by faith. Not just having some mental ascent. No, no, living by faith is those who put it into action. In other words, what the church needs today is stick to Spiritual stick to to press on, to be tenacious in what God's called us to do. I'm sure it's hard to imagine this now looking at me, but in high school I was an all-state cross-country runner. In my last race, I ran 3.1 miles in 16 minutes. Now, I wasn't originally a runner. I was actually a soccer player, but the soccer coach was also the cross-country coach at our high school. And so he talked a bunch of us soccer players in to running cross-country. And so the first day of practice, we were giving him a hard time, and we said, oh, there's no balls and no nets and no goals. What are we supposed to do it out here, you know, giving him, a, giving him a hard time? And I said to him, I said, Coach, I said, I, I, don't, I know how to play soccer. I don't know how to run this cross country. And he looked at me and gave me a speech for the ages. He said, run and don't stop. That's what this author is telling the church. Run and don't stop. Even if you feel like it, don't. Even if you're weary, even if you're tired, even if you're lonely, even if you feel like you can't continue to know, he's saying here, don't stop. Paul said, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we're called to. So my friends, the question is simple. Will your faith be inactive 
or will it be active? One of those will be rewarded. The other will be judged. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. May it find a place in our hearts, in our souls, and in our lives. Lord, forgive us of, of, of coming up short of what you've called us to do. Forgive us for not loving others. Forgive us for not encouraging others. Forgive us for being selfish. Forgive us for being cowards. And Father, help us to live by your truth and your word and your, and, 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 and your gospel that we might live boldly towards those around us. Help us, O oh Lord, to be the kind of living, breathing, active community of faith that you've called us to be, that your kingdom will come and your will will be done right here in Forest as it is in heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.